Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode three of the Wasted Potential podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Justin Jangles, Science Lat. I'm here, as always, with my co-host, LSP. Say hi, LSP. Hi, Justin. I was going to do I the re- same joke, but it wouldn't be original twice. Yeah, I know. I, re- I really got to, like, give you a better opportunity to introduce yourself. No, I'm content with it, produ- introducing myself like that. Yeah, I don't have near your charisma, so I'd rather just, like, do dad jokes when the opportunity presents itself. Cool. I'll have the modicum of uh, charisma at the beginning. I'll try to interject some not funny jokes uh, while you're talking because you've actually done, like you, like for all the podcasts, you've done all the work, all the research, you've compiled the outline, and I'm just kind of here. So in case you wanted a little behind the scenes look at how the podcast is done. You're the talent. You're, you're, you're the diva of this, truly. I'm just a producer. I um, do aspire to be a diva. So what are we talking about today? Well, we can start with the elections. The midterms just happened. Uh, We were expecting a red tsunami, which got downgraded to a red wave, then became a red trickle, red stream, red droplets, and then Ben Shapiro summed it up perfectly. It's the red wedding. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so we touched on it a little bit last week, but that was only two days after the uh, the, the election was held. It was hardly now, concluded last week. Yeah, was, so now we have a much better picture of how things have how things have played out for the 2022 midterm elections. It looks like the Democrats are going to maintain control of the Senate, which is cool. Republicans have won it, but they've barely won it. So uh, I'm sorry, Republicans have won the House. They're By a take fingernails inch. Yeah, it's a very close uh, re- difference in the House. So they really can't afford any defections. Any defections work in the Democrats' favor. Yeah, so why is this... I mean, if you look at it just objectively in a vacuum, it looks like the Democrats like lost seats. Why is this a good thing? Why are we... He- uh, holding this up as like a, a good result from the election? Um, well, this is a blowback from the Dobbs effect. There were a number of reasons why it looked bad for the Democrats. It's an off-year election. Usually in off-year elections, the opposite of the president's party is motivated to vote. Inflation is pretty high. People are feeling a little less confident about the way things are going. Uh, more and more Americans are reporting issues, uh, concerns with crime, concerns with inflation. So it just wasn't a good time to be a Democrat. And all of this happens I mean, just last year, there was this crazy Republican fervor over critical race theory being taught in schools. Then there was a fervor over gay people being taught in schools. So it seemed like a lot of momentum was working their way. So they really had to work to fuck that up. And how did they fuck it up? Uh, like, by running yeah, Herschel uh, Walker? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, even that one. That was going to the runoff. Yeah, it's so uh, the article you sent me said that this is so since 1922, 100 years, there have been three. Previous instances of the president's party gaining or losing no Senate seats and losing fewer than 10 House seats in the president's first midterm. 100 years, and this is the fourth time this has happened. And one of those times, the only one that happened in our lifetime, was in 2002 with George Bush. And did anything happen in George Bush's first term just that a, might have influenced that? Just a tiny little reconstruction project in downtown New York and Washington, D.C. Oh, okay. Can't, can't say. Can't say what it was. Can't say what it was. Uh, well, if you know, you know. Um, it's scary. <laughs> so, what are your takeaways on this? My takeaways is that, like, I was really scared that the fear mongering that they were doing. So, the critical race theory and the uh, the uh, the gay panic stuff, and right now the the horrible, horrible, horrible anti trans panic. That stuff I thought was like feeding red meat to a very, very motivated base. But it looks like that wasn't the that wasn't most of the country. It does seem like even like the moderates and the independents and even the less extreme conservatives are kind of getting sick of hearing about why are you focusing so much of your campaign on trans people? Why is that like why is this they they see it for what a lot of them see it for what it is. It's it's virtue signaling. And this notion that god damn there are so many election deniers, I think that turned a lot of people off too. Like election deniers did way too good in the election. That it that's still bad, but all of the election deniers who were like going for uh like election councils, like to to be head of like an election council to control to oversee elections, I'm pretty sure almost all of them lost. And after two, you know, close to two years, not about two years uh, since, you know, the 2020 election, there has been no proof that the election was, you know, the election was stolen. There's no no proof of widespread voter fraud. There's there's that Dinesh D'Souza film. There is that Dinesh D'Souza film. If that and doesn't I'm, prove it, I don't know what does. I guess not. <laughs> we got to watch that someday. 
uh, we'll do a live reaction to it. Um, I'm not sure I'm convinced, so your hypothesis needs some refining. I'm not sure I'm convinced necessarily that the red meat didn't work. There's a lot of hungry carnivores out there. Uh, they don't like trans people. Uh, I have no doubt a lot of this stuff was a primary motivating factor in getting these people out there. The election denial stuff, however, might have been more of an issue. So I recall seeing a poll a while back, and I wish I could supply it now, but there was a poll that said that the average voter trusts Republicans more on the issue of education than Democrats. And this comes after like two years of Republicans fear-mongering about patriotic education, critical race theory framing white people as oppressors, uh, and you know, of course, the, there's pornography in our school libraries. All of which is untrue, but it's enough to convince the average person who doesn't read anything that Democrats have taken over school and they've they've <gasps> turned it into a uh, a cultural socialization project. So I, it probably has more to do with the election denial stuff that the people they get to run on denying elections, election denial is not particularly popular, but people they get to run on that tend to be ele election deniers. And that's because there was a litmus test in the Republican Party uh, on whether or not you could win your primary was based on whether or not you would agree that the 2020 election was stolen. To this day, we are, we're more than a week removed from the election. Carrie Lake has still not conceded the governor's race in Arizona. Uh, and it looks like she's setting up a contest to say that it was in fact stolen. Yeah, and I want to know what the evidence is. Like, what what's some of the evidence that she's put forth? Yeah, pull, the the best evidence they had was that the so there was a printer error in Maricopa County that did not stop people from voting. It was worth ex stressing that people were allowed to vote. Right, the printer error didn't disallow people to vote. It just required them to submit their ballots in something called like box three or a secure box. Right, so that their mm -hmm. their votes would be counted later at a different location. That is like the error that I can think of. The other error they seem to have, well, not an error, just the fact of the elections, was that lines were long. Now, what's funny is now they've discovered that long lines are an issue. Democrats <laughs> have been bitching about long lines going back since the repeal of the preclearance formula from the uh, the Voting Rights Act. So that the Supreme Court struck down the preclearance formula of the Voting Rights Act and immediately Republican legislatures all across the South, because of course it's the South, started closing down polling places in predominantly black neighborhoods. So that resulted in, in really long lines, exacerbated line issues, uh, where lots of people had to stand in line for hours just to cast a ballot. Republicans got a taste of that. But I don't think it's because polling places were closed uh, in Republican-leaning areas or anything like that in Maricopa County. I think it's because there was a Republican machine dedicated to describing the process of voting by mail as fraudulent. So a lot of people didn't have faith in casting their ballots by mail. Instead, they would just drop them off on election night. Or vote in person. Yeah, I want to know, even if all that stuff, let's say if the long lines uh, turned people away or there was a problem with the machine, let's say, let's say those were actually problems that actually did impact votes. Why does she think that it only affected Republican votes? How does this make, how does this support this notion that they're stealing the election? Well, they're relying on the fact that Katie Hobbs was the secretary of state for Arizona and thus would be the person who oversees the elections. But there is no evidence like Maricopa County's like elections board is Republican. Uh, the chairman of the Maricopa, Maricopa County Board of Supervisors is, is is a Republican. He's been critical of this idea that anybody's slow rolling the ballots. And he prov he provides a number of reasons for why the results were t going so slowly. So the Washington Post provides a, a good litmus on this. Voters are voting in person more. They're dropping off their ballots at a polling site on election day rather than by mail. They, they uh, This is up 70 percent from 2020. Signatures are required to be verified and checked by bipartisan teams, which takes time. And Arizona doesn't use extraction machines and states like Florida do. So the process is much, much longer. Uh, election workers are not allowed to process ballots until election day by state law, and ballots are counted in a centralized location in Phoenix rather than at, uh, at these polling places individually. And there's also the fact that Arizona is just a lot more competitive than it used to be. So they've done all these measures to, quote unquote, make voting more secure, and that's you know, by extension, making it take a lot longer to count these votes. But aren't they using like the, how long they're taking to, uh, to count votes as like evidence that they're trying to cheat? That's what they're doing. I don't think it works well. It, it definitely doesn't work well when the GOP chair of the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors has to interject to say, this is a bullshit uh, argument that this, that's being uh, put forward by Carrie Lake and Ilk. So I, I don't think so. I also just found a, an article from 538. Mm -hmm. uh, where Republicans have made it harder to vote so far, and, and like there's a lot of uh, voting restrictions in Georgia that made it harder to vote. Yet yeah, in a lot of states, let's see, Florida, Texas, Missouri, Alabama, 
and uh, a few others, they've actively tried to make it harder to vote. They're actively trying to disenfranchise voters and disproportionately in Latino and black, uh, you know, districts and counties. Because, of and course, they are. Yeah. And yeah, for some reason, for some reason, it just it's always disproportionately in those counties. But what and, and she's saying that her voters have been disenfranchised. You would think that if the lines are long and the, these issues, uh, <laughs> these issues take a while, rather than advocate for removing early voting, they would uh, they'd be arguing for expanding it because a lot of these problems could have been preempted if people would have just voted early and people didn't in Arizona. Uh, so we we kind of got a a re a redux a retake a redo I don't know what word you would use of the 2020 red mirage where it appeared um, promising for the GOP early. But as votes continued to come in, that changed. And that was more or less the case with this election again. Do you think there should be a punishment for people who refuse to concede their elections on without any sort of like grounds to challenge it? Uh, just being publicly humiliated. Yeah, I, I want people. I, I don't want to like restrict people's rights to to bitch and whine. I do I'd like rather just some, call them losers and move on. I do like how uh, The Guardian in particular like puts the headline for this election denier Kari Lake refuses to concede Arizona governor race she lost. I I love that. Like that is a lot of people say, oh, that's not neutral. Where is literally anything false in that? And no, we like it's not neutral to treat election deniers with some sort of like plausible deniability or charity. That's not neutral. Uh, I I, is giving them credence. uh, This is so detached from the election. But I hate this idea that the media needs to be neutral for neutrality's sake. They should be biased towards the truth. Right. They should not be biased towards neutrality. Biased towards neutrality gives this idea that there's both sides of an issue have some points, both sides of an issue at wrong. It's just not the case, right? This, the, this spat of election denialism is a uniquely Republican thing. Calling mobs to the Capitol to overturn an election is a uniquely Republican thing. Defending that is a uniquely Republican thing. This is not a both sides thing. Carrie Lake is, lost her election. She lost. Uh, and the, this, this new meme that you can uh, contest this. I don't think there's any reasonable road for her to contest this, but this new meme of of contesting or denying elections or describing them as fraudulent is very much a uniquely Republican thing. Republicans have been bitching about voter fraud uh, going back all the way to Obama, um, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, they've probably been bitching about that since JFK. Except unlike since JFK, there's just not a lot of evidence of fraud, at least not in the last 20 years, not a lot of meaningful evidence. But yeah, shit it, Republicans would do. I'm sorry, what's that? I was say, yeah, if we did have a quote unquote neutral article about this, be phrased something like, as of a uh, time of writing, there has been no substantial evidence for widespread voter fraud that could influence any uh, election in the past, you know, three, four elections. How many want to go? But critics say <laughs> that what has happened on election day is unforgivable. That sounds neutral, but it's very obviously not neutral. It's giving credence to someone who's just full of shit. It's idea laundering. It's some people are saying this and thinking this, and so we're going to report on it. But it's not true. People think wrong things a lot, and it doesn't matter how many of them there are. If it's not true, if there's no evidence for it, you need to phrase it like there is no evidence, but a lot of people believe it. I think that is responsible reporting. Putting forth the, uh, you know, election denier Kari Lake refuses to concede. The governor race she lost, that's new that is neutral. That's what neutral should be. It's biased towards the facts. She is an election denier. She did lose her election. There is no proof that there's any sort of wrongdoing that would have flipped it her way. So fuck yeah. Do these biased seeming headlines because they are more true than a quote unquote neutral one. Now, here's the question. Because I imagine election denialism works in Carrie Lake's favor. What do you do? I mean, beyond just quippy Guardian headlines, what do you do about this new phenomena of Republican contest uh, against elections, Republicans contesting elections? How do we because this is going to be the new normal, I I think, going forward, because Trump laid the groundwork for it and there's some success to it. Even if they got a shellacking this election, I think if I don't think they're likely to change in the future from bitching and complaining that the elections are stolen or fraudulent. What do you do about this problem if they whip up their their base into a frenzy every every election uh and how do you deal with the the danger this poses to election workers deplatforming just deplatforming kick them just, just take <laughs> away your, fucking, yeah take her away yeah. your microphone you're a loser just go away yeah like uh, make that part of the uh, terms of service if you are uh, deny elections <laughs> terms it, of without, service for elections fuck it yeah no if you're spreading misinformation yeah fucking get 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 rid of them unironically oh. Well, if, big you, if, you, if you think looking. the election was stolen, it, this isn't just having questions. They're making it, they're saying the election was stolen. Trump was the true winner. 
Provide your fucking proof, which you haven't. You haven't been able to do that for two years. All of the court cases, uh, none of them went in your favor. You're obviously wrong. And so what you're doing is spreading a lie that is hurting democracy. Fucking get rid of them. Getting rid of them, that threat to free speech, and that I've, does suppress free speech. That is a far less, that, that is a far less, hold on, what am I trying to say here? That is far less dangerous to ban those people, to, to make that little blow against free speech, than to allow them to just spread outright lies on the internet that is affecting I, I 70% of the fucking Republican Party. I disagree 100%. I, I think that if you ban people, let's say you ban people from office or you deplatform people who who um, who are running for office but want to contest it. I, I think all you're going to do is fuel the conspiracies even more. Uh, I'm not sure this is the correct answer. It, it certainly hasn't worked for any of the Republicans who've largely been deplatformed while spreading election denial nonsense. Uh, it's only exacerbated the issue with the GOP more. Social media has largely responded the same way that you're advocating. Election denialism hasn't gone away. It's 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 only been become worse. Um, the majority of like uh, uh, Republicans who who ran this election were election deniers. Um, so more than half of Republicans running ran on the idea that the 2020 election was fraudulent. This isn't an idea that you can just censor away. Uh, people do need some confidence in elections. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, and plus, you need to leave open the possibility that guess what? Sometimes elections are probably going to be fraudulent and you might need a way to contest them. Uh, even if you don't have evidence, uh, I'm not saying that's happening here, but I mean, this does happen. You, 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 you got to have evidence though. You know what? A fucking Chad move. Well, I mean, let's say like here's, Carrie here's, Lake here's, loses here's, 99% to one, like obviously stolen election, obvious, obvious discrepancy, but she doesn't have evidence. Like how, what do you, do you just censor that? Ban that? I think, I think the Chad move is if you are the person who beat her, who beat her? Uh, Katie man? Hobbs. Katie Hobbs. Katie Hobbs. Uh, invite, just say, hey, all right, if you have questions about the election integrity, um, put them forth. I'm l I would love to hear your evidence. Just call her out on it. Like, make her, like, say, hey, if you find evidence, convincing evidence that the election was stolen, I'll actually concede. Or, or rather, I will, uh, I will agree to a second election, a redo election. I will agree to that. But you have to find evidence for it. Put her on the, put her on the heels. Well, Show her, call the fucking bluff. That's certainly a move Hobbs can do, but I'm referring in a more uh, a macro sense, like a cultural sense. Like, how do we deal with this problem? There's there's a million Carrie Lakes out there. Like, we we have to deal with this this phenomenon, not this person. Trumpism is here to stay. We need to deal with Trumpism. We need to take Trumpism as it is and handle the idea that it's not going away, and we can't just censor it away. Do you think that the election denial stuff will go away with Trump? Because Trump seems to be like he's I don't. sliding pretty hard. No, I think I don't think Trump invented Trumpism. I think he just put his brand name on Trumpism. I think Trumpism uh, at its heart was always this fascistic bent of conspiracy demagoguery that underlied conservative politics in the United States. And it's always been kept in check by this sort of country club Republican, this sort of an elitist Republican. Uh, Trump just tapped into a very real phenomena that's already existed within Republicans. People who do believe in conspiracy theories, people who do believe that elections uh, are fraudulent, you can't trust them. He, he just put his name on it. And this stuff isn't going away. I think Trumpism, I, I, because of Trump giving a microphone, these people are now like the new GOP base. Something like 70 to 80% of Republicans believe the election was stolen. Something like 50% of Republicans believe that it's okay to use violence to preserve the traditional way of life. And something like 25% of Republicans believe in QAnon or some, it has some truth to it. We can't censor this away. It's a thing. It's here to stay. And it's taken over the, well, I don't want to say taken over because it was always there, but it's, it's a major part of the GOP now. Yeah. That's part of what scares me I, because, you know, what's the, uh, the, the new age adage, like sunlight's the best disinfectant. Uh, if you let all these people speak, you can just disprove them. And no, bleach is the best be disinfectant. Feeling. Bleach is the best <laughs> disinfectant. We need, yes. we need bleach, so what's our bleach, right? It, it can't just be enough to just respond to this stuff. We need to sanitize it, right? We need some other way of tackling it beyond censorship. What is our bleach? I, I think the best bleach you could have is, I don't know, I, I kind of want to say like some sort of a, a populist working class movement on the left that kind of captures the same group of disaffected people. But I don't know how you fix conspiracy prone nonsense in the world. And I kind of sympathize with social media platforms that have to deal with this that don't really because I mean, it, it affects their bottom line. I don't know that there's a good answer for it. I don't know how you do it. And I think the best answer you have is not government intervention. It's probably third party intervention, like fact checkers, like uh, social media fact checkers on Twitter or on Facebook. That is the best kind of sunshine you're going to get. Is it bleach? 
I don't know. Is it working? I don't know. Is Twitter becoming yeah, there's more, no more one of a thing. conservative hug box? Yeah. yeah there's well, no it, one thing that's going to fix it. Fact checkers, a lot of uh, the conservatives, like, they know the truth already. And so there is no fact check that you can do to convince them otherwise. But the fact checkers are part of a system working against them. Right. I can't it, trust Yeah, but it, it is a system. Like, I, I actually loved, did, I think Twitter stopped, or at least mostly stopped doing this. But, uh, and it's never going to happen now. Not with uh, Elon Musk and 25% of his staff at the helm. 25% of his staff of the half that were left um it's in They're working there very again. hard. Be be nice. Yeah, yeah, they're working hard. They're working 28-hour days now <laughs> at, oh, at at 115% intensity. But YouTube does this thing like if a, a video is on climate change, they'll put underneath like climate change is real. Uh or I've seen a few videos where they were talking about a conspiracy. Uh, uh, talking about a conspiracy theory, and then underneath they'll have the little fact check saying, "Hey, uh, the the big lie that uh, there's a conspiracy that the 2020 election was stolen. There's been no evidence that they hate that. I think they hate that the most because there's because two things there. One, they're not being censored, are they? If you put that underneath someone's yeah, post, no, they're you, allowed to say what they want. They're just getting a counterfactual. Yeah, and if free speech is what you're after, well, we're just adding more free speech to it." Why does that upset you? Is your idea not good enough to survive the fact check? If it's true and the fact check is wrong, I mean, people can figure it out for themselves, right? Isn't that what you're arguing for? If you're a free speech advocate, people can figure out the truth for themselves? It's cool. So let your statement stand up against the fact checkers, and I guess people will just walk away from it uh, knowing the real truth, which coincidentally is the one that you don't have evidence for. That is part of the overall cornucopia of solutions. Um... I think the answer more broadly, because these fact checks aren't designed. So let me start again. These fact checks are not designed to speak to the conspiracy prone uh, psychotics that call themselves QAnon believer Republicans, whatever these people are. The the twenty five percent of Republicans that that already committed the idea of QAnon, they're dead. They're they're already gone. They're you can't save them. They're going down with the ship. You need to speak to the moderates. Any of these people who who would be kind of uh, turned off by some of the extreme extremism exhibited by Trumpism. Hopefully these fact checks speak more to them uh, so that they punish Republicans who spread conspiracies electorally. But the problem is, big chunk of the GOP base believes this shit and they cry like women, every, no, I'm sorry, not sexist, they cry like <laughs> men who are, who are in touch with their, comfortable with their masculinity every time there's a fact check. So it leads to shit like Facebook, for example, because uh, this just happened. Facebook says they're not going to fact check Trump statements anymore because he's announced he's running for president. So now we're back into a more scarce media environment where the discourse is dictated by the crazies. The the inmates are running the asylum again, which is great. It, it could because it would be unfair. I want to know why. Like, say you're going to fact check Trump, fact check Biden too. I think that's a big. That could be a yes. good way to like, yeah, fact check Biden. Purposely go out of your way to find any little thing that Biden gets wrong and fact check that. Biden, like, Biden. He, yeah, he's going to get stuff wrong. It's like it, it, he will get things wrong. It, zero in on that. Fact check the fuck out of him. Because now what are the conservatives, conspiracy types going to say? Now what are they going to say? Now well, they can't call the fact it biased. Checkers? Or, well, or are they going to trust the fact checkers? The, the fact checkers they'll, are they'll saying still Biden's call it biased. Yeah, they'll still call it bias, but Biden did get fact checked on by Twitter himself after after a, a tweet was posted from his face. I'm sorry, his uh, Twitter account or the White House Twitter account. Uh, and Republicans were kind of jeering at this, like, Haha, "Twitter's fact checking Biden, Haha. dude. That's a fucking good thing. Like, media is supposed to act as a fourth estate. And while I wouldn't consider Twitter to be traditional media, whether we like it or not, this is more and more where people are getting their news. People more and more get their news from social media than they do actual, I, I say, reliable, but mainstream news sources uh, nbc cbs yeah well or in the washington post or new york times it's not as relied upon anymore uh as twitter because twitter is quick and we we live in a world dictated by the cnn effect and people want information now and twitter is instantaneous at giving you that information now and it also gives you a dopamine high when it gives you information that validates a worldview you already have and more than that, it's filtered usually through the voices of idiots who are going to feed that information to you in the most bombastic or out of context way possible. So it's probably necessary for platforms like Twitter to step up and act as a fourth estate. Whether they like it or not, that is their role now in this 21st century media environment. All right, so did we, did we solve this issue in 20 minutes? No, we, we know, can't. It's been 25 minutes. We have to have solved Trumpism and social media deplatforming and information and misinformation. We have to have solved it. We spent uh, uh, 
25 minutes on it. So we can talk about how it might have affected the midterm, maybe, because <laughs> uh, Nancy Pelosi brought up something that uh, that I I wondered last week, and I, I still muse about. Um, but Nancy Pelosi claims that people are voting against Republicans because of political violence from the right. How true do we think that is? Because I, again, I I think last week what I said something to the effect was uh, if if I'm some sort of a disaffected moderate, I might look at these motherfuckers celebrating the attempted assassination or not assassination, kneecapping. Of the third in line to the president and posting pictures of underwear and saying, huh, look at my Halloween costume. I might look at those people like they're fucking psychotic, like these people are a threat to my very safety and existence uh, because they're attacking representatives who are elected to represent me. Uh, whether they like Pelosi or not, they don't like Pelosi. She is influential. She is a leader of this country, right? She is third in line to be the president. Well, she was third in line to be president. So, I mean, as, like as a disaffected moderate, I might be a little turned off by the celebration, the overt celebration of violence that goes on from the right or the overt uh, apologies for violence that goes on on the right from the party that claims themselves to be law and order. You cannot you cannot make a mockery of of, a, of an old man getting bludgeoned with a hammer or you, you can't say shit like I'm going to pardon the rioters who tried to overthrow democracy. Right. Or 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 even celebrate people who do ads where they're shooting target saying i'm striking fear into you liberals these people are psychotic and i would imagine some moderates might look at that rethink their votes and it might cost the gop so inshallah this ends up this ends up with a little bit of blowback against the grand old party i don't know if it switches anybody from republican to democrat because this is just uh, the gop conservatives can always say it's a crazy lone wolf person you know it's never the result of their ideology uh and if there's but if there's a terrorist attack like if the Bernie Sanders supporter who did Steve Scalise, uh, they identified uh, it's Bernie Sanders and his ideology. That's the reason Scalise was targeted. And Democrats, it was probably a bad move politically, but it was at least the honest thing to do. It was like, yeah, this dude was motivated by a certain ideology. Republicans don't take ownership of that. I don't think it switched anybody because, you know, independents are probably the stupidest voters. But I don't, I don't, there's no data uh, to support that, but it's what's in my heart. So, so I'm the one spreading misinformation. I don't think it switched anybody who's already drank the Kool Aid on this. But it might have motivated someone who might not otherwise have voted, who who was already leaning Democrat, and might have motivated them to uh, cast their votes when they otherwise. That's wouldn't. possible too. Um, I, I I try to go easy on the poor independents. They're they're stuck on a fence. That might be true. That I'm trying to think of how I could argue this. The the Republican ownership. Of violence, this this dismissal of, or, or I shouldn't say the lack of ownership of of violence that comes from them, uh, or this apology for violence that comes from them, might not convince people who are already going to vote Republican. But when you're a moderate who's looking at this, you might get told essentially, "Don't listen to me. Let, don't believe your lion eyes. Listen to me." And it, it's a little insulting to the intelligence when you look at Republicans who do ad after ad after ad after ad where they're shooting guns talking about how they're striking fear into the hearts of liberals or they're going there. I have rhino hunting permits. Come get your rhino hunting permit so you can hunt rhinos with me. Um, not rhinoceroses. Republicans use violent rhetoric to get violent results. And then they apologize for it. And then they run away from it. And then they deny they ever did it. You don't get that from Democrats. And I think there are some people who can see through the bullshit apologia of, of don't listen to me. Or, or sorry, don't listen to your lion eyes. Listen to me. That's the second time I fucked up that phrase. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how many other countries where, I mean, the Second Amendment and gun control is always going to be, it's always going to be a huge thing in America. It's always going to be an issue because there's, because there's going to be another mass shooting here in about 20 minutes. Uh, there was, a, I'm pretty sure there was a big mass shooting that we saw like this past week. They're all, they're like background noise at this point. Violence is just kind of a way of life. And it, it, I don't think that anybody cares I anymore. No one, no one who isn't already convinced that guns are a problem, no one's going to be convinced that guns are a problem with the next mass shooting. And so I don't see how an attack with a hammer is going to convince somebody that, okay, violence is now a problem on the right. Because it is a status symbol to show that gun in your political ads. People don't read it as violence. They read it as like this weird form of strength that implies violence. They want to be read as like, yeah, I'm a big, tough, buff dude, and I could kick your ass. I want you to know that I could kick your ass. I could beat the shit out of you if you, if you provoke me. That way I get to be tough and, uh, tough and dominant without actually getting the blame or negative 
pushback that comes from actually being violent. And so violence is kind of baked into all these gun messages. That's what guns are for. Guns are for violence. Yeah, on the right, this is true. On the right, they embody this message because they are very much the sort of people that would like this idea. The, the, I, they would celebrate naked violence or naked force as a way to assert dominance. But again, the majority of voters aren't exactly like that. They're not exactly these hardcore Republicans who are kind of only getting their seats because either the districts are gerrymandered in their favor and they have to be conservative to win, or they need an endorsement from an extremist president like Trump to win. But the majority of Americans favor changing our gun laws. The majority of Americans favor more restrictions on who can own a gun, what kinds of guns they can own, and how they can acquire those guns. Uh, so the, the polling isn't in their favor. The problem is the geography is not in their favor. So you're more likely to get the crazy people who embrace this gun culture because they got a small dick than you are to get the, the moderate who might see, yeah, the majority of Americans recognize this is an issue and we need to do something about this issue. Uh, hey, here, uh, and here, again, this is... Here's a theory. What's that? What's here's a the theory. theory. All right, so um, they love – so guns are something that the right really loves to use because they, it's a very easy way to scare people. They're trying to take away your guns. You know what? I'm not going to say that every – I just say because I got a small dick. But. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm not going to say that everybody with a, with a gun fetish has a small dick. Some of them There's have small – There's a very phallic – Hey, oh, now, I mean. some of them have small vaginas. <laughs> okay. True, true, true. All right. And, and like, statistically, 0.05% of them have a, a small something else. We have our own guns now. You know what that gun's called? What's that? Abortion. They took away abortion. Like, that was, I'm pretty sure, just right behind the economy, like, the biggest thing that drove uh, liberal and, 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 and Gen Democrat Z voters, voters out. Yeah. yeah. But, and the, the response the to this, I love the response to this. Um, rather than, like, introspect about maybe how this new generation of Americans who grew up with Roe v. Wade being the law of the land uh, for the better part of 50 years probably isn't going to fall on their sword for abortion bans. Um, rather than deal with that, they just suggest, well, we should just raise the voting age. Just, just stop raise them from the voting. voting just raise the voting age. Which, if you want to get to the, the demographic breakdown of voters... <laughs> yeah, I love those, like, all right, we, uh, I love those responses to the, 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 the red wedding, the, the lack of a red wave. It, okay, we got to keep certain people from voting, just naked with it. Right, raise the voting age to uh, 25. Fuck it. Raise it to 25. Why? Because the, the people under 25 aren't voting for us. It's so naked. All right. Uh, wh wh why? What, what do you think is the reason they'll give for why you have to be 25 before you vote? What do you think well, is the, the reason? The brain's not fully developed until you're oh, 25. Oh, sweet. Can we also prevent uh, people who are 75 and older from voting? Their brains aren't working anymore. I mean, not that might be insulting and not true, but it's as true as someone who is 18. Like, their brain's perfectly functioning. Um, so over half of the, the votes that Republicans get are people aged 50 or older. Now, if you're going to put on an age cap, I mean, these people have to be drag kicking and screaming and whining into the 21st century how about we just put an age cap on voting if anybody's got a greater vested interest in the long-term future of this country it's people who are younger right than people who are older they're close to death what difference does it make to them if health care yeah, is let, repealed let, or not like, you're, you're gonna you... die anyway in a few <laughs> fucking years just get... yeah, all right so nobody over the age of let's say 65 if you're retired fuck it you're you're gone no more voting for you if you've ever put <laughs> truck if you've ever put truck nuts on your vehicle you are a felon, obviously, and uh, and felons can't vote. Uh, who else should we bar from voting? That is so would fucking help us. tacky. Anybody who flies a Confederate flag. Anybody who's fly okay, you're illiterate. A, you're illiterate, and, and you're also you. you're uh, a traitor. Treason. Yeah, a you're traitor. a traitor. If you've flown a Confederate flag, uh, you're no longer you know you're an enemy of the United States. You're not allowed to vote. Who else can we bar from voting purely for political reasons? Because it would now help us. I'm not saying we should ban them. But it would be exceptionally ironic if white men had to memorize the preamble to the Constitution in order to register to vote. <laughs> literacy. Oh, man. Liter God damn it. I wonder how literacy tests would affect things. It it's obviously a horrible idea. Have you, like, have I you ever <laughs> actually like read like those old school literacy tests? Once. I know I've read them. I just can't remember what they're like. They're entirely nonsense. So one is like you need to memorize the, the, the parts of the Constitution and recite them from memory. Others are like you like draw, word for word. draw, yeah, word for word, draw you can't three. Just say second Amendment. You can't just say Second Amendment. That's about a nope. uh, right to bear arms. Nope, dude. You think they're gonna let black people vote with like that? Did then they even was... check the white responses? I, isn't that a thing? They didn't even really check white responses. So, so they they have forms. No, well, white people didn't have to because they would be grandfathered in. 
So when a lot of these liter- literacy test laws were passed, the the law states that if your grandfather was allowed to vote in elections, you would be allowed to vote in elections. Now, this is during Reconstruction. So if you're black, your grandfather was a slave and slaves weren't allowed to vote. So if you're black, you didn't vote and you had to take a literacy test and you had to pay a poll tax. But if you're white, you got grandfathered in. You had a, n- a different way to get in. And if you still couldn't prove that your grandfather was eligible to vote, e- you would even get different literacy tests in some circumstances. But the questions they would ask on these literacy tests would be ridiculous. Like draw three different interlocking circles with one circle 40 degrees above that. Like it would be like so nonsensical that it's just not, it's not a question anybody could reasonably pass with no matter how intelligent they are. And one question, one incorrect question would denote an incorrect uh, or a failing grade, at least in the state of Louisiana. So yeah, this, this shit was like pretty fucked. And, And we might as well talk about this as a broader issue. So 54, this last election, 54% 54% of men voted Republican, 52% of women voted Democrat, but white suburban women shifted Republican and women's turnout was higher, but we so are- So that 52% of women uh, was more people than 54% of men Yeah, uh, in total? Uh, yes. 48% of women are stupid, but I, I shouldn't say that because it's about to like betray a point I'm trying to make because I'm trying to make an actual point here. We on the Democratic Party are very, very bad- at speaking to white people. And there are structural reasons for this that we need to deal with. As society has moved forward, we've become more conscientious of the fact that history and systems have created unequal opportunities for black and white people. That white people have basically been privileged by a system and black people have been disprivileged by it. And black people, their circumstances today are largely a byproduct of systems that created them. And I think if you're white, you really don't want to hear that. Because if you're white, you don't really feel systems on an individual level. No. <laughs> you're, you're seeing people having a conversation about you, your race, and what you did. And you're not really invited to the table to be part of that conversation. Well, you you're going to tell me that I have white privilege? I grew up in a trailer. I was poor. All right? I had to work for my money. All right? Be white didn't help me get anything. That's what everyone says. Because... I mean, yeah, you're not going to feel systemic effects on an individual level. And it's really hard to say. And those, I think that's, I don't know how to improve that messaging because, like, the systems part is true. Like, the truth is not enough here. The messaging has to be way, way, way better. And the fact that you really don't feel uh, any sort of systemic effects on an individual level, unless it's, like, blatant. And it has to be really, and even if it's blatant, even if, like, you were a white person and you saw... Uh, that you got a job because, like, your uh, boss was was racist. Even that is just an individual instance. Right? It's not a. It's not a. It's not proof of any sort of systemic issue. So how do we bridge that gap of we have systemic problems that do tend to affect people disproportionately because of an enormously complex series of historical events and how that influences finance and housing and public infrastructure and education. How can we show? those things and why they influence people because people are individuals without like i I really do think that messaging of like white privilege it it might be true but there's another way to say it that's also true that's not going to make white people feel like they're being attacked yeah it's it's only it's really true on a macro level it's very hard to digest on a micro level um and and i i don't you don't have to be the hillbilly trailer trash guy living in, in, in a trailer in, in rural Mississippi or Appalachia, Justin. Um, <laughs> you, 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 could be, you could be a middle-class white suburbanite. And you know what? You worked hard. And you do work hard. And you, life wasn't without its tribulations. And you had to make a lot of sacrifices. And I have no doubt that's, that's true for a lot of white people. And I have no doubt that it's true that a lot of white people are generally progressive on race issues and they deplore racism and they are otherwise good people who might still vote Republican because they feel like the framing of these conversations frames them in a negative light. It frames them as oppressors or, 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 or haves when they don't feel that way. They don't feel like they are oppressors. They don't feel like they're haves, and they feel like they're being talked down to. And that's a very, that's a, it, it feels like you're being condescended to when you're spoken to like that. And Democrats need to find a better way to have these conversations. And I don't know how to have these conversations. That's well, a frustrating it, thing. Well, I don't know. So we, we solved uh, internet, you know, uh, misinformation on the internet. We solved that in the first 25 yeah, minutes. So let's, let's solve, solve racism. Yeah, so let's solve racism in the next. Uh, I mean, we're kind of, we don't have 25 minutes left of the podcast, but we, we can solve racism real quick. Well. What's, what's a term you would use other than like white privilege? Something honky that came credit. to credit. Honky credit? 
Okay. Lean into the racism so it's it, it's funny? I mean, if black people get to reclaim the N-word with a soft A, I'm just saying. Wait, 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 wait. You're not white. You can't say honky. <laughs> oh, shit. With a hard K. I- I'm stuck between two races. If you're mixed race, <laughs> what kind of pass do you get? Do you get both passes? <clears throat> I think- God, that must be mm. sweet. <laughs> Do you get both, or do you get, like, half of each? I feel like if you're a gay, trans, mixed-race person, you are, like, unstoppable. Like, you get everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we obviously know that the people who have it the best in society are the the gay, the trans, gay, trans mixed-race mixed race people. <laughs> yeah. Now, they're the ones with the real privilege, because they get to, I mean, who cares about, like, housing and discrimination and stuff like that? They get to say all the all the fun words. When, when... When is when are the white people going to get a break? When are when, yeah, I, that's what I want to know. When are we as white people going to get ours? When you buy Twitter. So let's talk about Twitter. I guess <laughs> when I buy Twitter, which, or, or you know, we could we could mention. Well, there is an education gap, so maybe the answer is just building smarter white people. And that sounds like so condescending as a way to put it, but Republicans tend to dominate high school diplomas, and Democrats tend to dominate college graduates. College graduates vote Democrat, Republicans and high school diplomas vote Republican. So the answer really is, let's just fix our educational system so that white people have more opportunities in life that they can recognize how the system privileges them. Uh, So you want to indoctrinate children. Ironically, though, that creates a catch-22 where they have to be privileged more by the system to recognize that the system privileges them. (coughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, a lot of the racism stuff. Like, that, that is for everybody. Like, all of the... Hold on, I need, I need to back up a bit. Uh, indoctrination is, is a nonsense word. It doesn't mean anything. Unless you're in a cult, you're not indoctrinated. If teaching critical race theory in school, if that's indoctrination, well, then America first education and patriotic education is also indoctrination. And in fact, more so. When you think of indoctrination in other countries, you're almost always thinking of like them venerating and just glamorizing. And what's another word? That I'm thinking of. Pull up a. Th- you, you know words. You have all the best words. I'm a very stable genius, but I don't. What have does a what does North How does North Korea treat Kim Jong Un? Like a dear leader, truly a dear leader. Deify. Um, deified. Yes, I think yeah. you kind of get this from a lot of Republican uh, personalities. So uh, yeah, we, I, I, we recognize quote... we recognize that like them deifying their leaders is bad. That's indoctrination, but we sort of deify like our like founding fathers and how many people de- deified Trump and just do like gloss over any bad thing in our history that is indoctrination questioning your country's like bad things that it's done that's the most fucking that is the most free you can possibly be when you can talk shit about your own government your own history that's the sign of a free country that would be Except when you do it, and then you get imprisoned in Russia for like half a gram of, not even half that gram, like oh, a little Brittany. bit of, of hashish oil. Yeah, Brittany Griner well. wasn't a <laughs> Brittany yeah, Griner wasn't so. a topic, but let's let's mention that real quick. How fucked is that? It is insanely hey. fucked mm. that another state is abusing their sovereignty against an American citizen, and people who proudly wrap themselves in the American fucking flag are celebrating a person being taken as a slave. It's disgusting. So patriotism is recognizing your country's flaws and dealing with them. Patriotism is not deifying flawed individuals. It's recognizing them as flawed individuals and dealing with it. And Republicans don't do that. So it used to be the case, so I'm stealing a Bill Maher quote here, it used to be the case that Democrats need to fall in love to win elections and Republicans need to fall in line to win elections. Republicans would fall in line. They're very strict and hierarchical. Now that you get both, Republicans absolutely build personalities, uh, uh, cults of personality around people. They did it with Trump, and they do it with any number of these these talking heads uh, that are leaders in the Republican Party. And they do it Josh because Hawley, the, Matt Gates, And they do it because the enemy of my enemy is my friend. They focus on what they hate, what they're against, what they need to fight. That's fight, fight. purely how they define themselves, yes, as an antagonism to something else. Usually so you don't have to agree on what you want. Yeah, you don't have to agree on what you want. You just have to. No, agree they don't on know what, what they want. Hate. They don't know what they. Trump went from "We love our LGBT people" to <laughs> "Fuck Britney Griner and fuck trans people, <coughs> fuck gay people." Yeah. Don't ask, don't tell. Was base. Trans people shouldn't be in the military. Uh, trans health care needs to be taken away. Uh, and I, we're no, not going to vote on a gay marriage codification bill. Yeah, and no, we say that, but like 
So we say that, and it's obviously true, but man, is it effective. I mean, we kind of agreed that Biden didn't win because people liked Biden. Biden won because people hated Trump. So maybe maybe there's something to all this hatred. Maybe we got to hate more. Democrats could tap into it, but I mean, then we'd be like them. Democrats mm-hmm. don't tap into it. Uh, contrary, I, again, I, I think this is contrary to popular belief. Democrats run on policies that bring us forward. Republicans run on, run on personalities that drag us backwards. Democrats say we need deal. We we have health care. We need to deal with health care in this country. So let's talk about Obamacare. Let's like let's make some health care reform. We have a climate change issue. We've got guns issues. We need to deal with all this stuff. Let's talk about how we can progress forward. Republicans don't have solutions for any of these things. What they do have are Ron DeSantis's who can attack trans people and take away trans people's health care. Does that fix society? Does that fix trans people? Does it do anything? It does nothing. It just it hurts fixes the they soul dislike. of the nation. I mean, that's the thing. You can't point to anything tangible that's being fixed or improved. You can't point to that stuff. It's the soul of the nation, this intangible, ethereal thing. If trans kids are allowed to mutilate themselves and, and wear dresses and give money to drag performers in these sexualized contexts, that's hurting the soul of the nation. I'm sorry, I don't know where that came from. That okay, that, that hurt my soul. Uh, yeah. Y- you need, a, like, a touch more uh, charisma to pull that off. I, yeah, I know, I... I will. I will work on that. You're. You're not. We're leaving that southern. In. You're not a southern conservative enough. You're gonna leave that <laughs> in. But like all of my Holocaust jokes get cut. Okay. Uh, well, you know, I mean, Hon- I, I, Honky McGee better be left in. Yeah, you know I, what? I'm, I, I'm I mixed let, race. You know, you can, you can, uh, <laughs> you you can edit this one and you can leave in all the holo joke, Holocaust jokes you want. Holo jokes. You got holo something you want to say? You got something you want to say, Justin? <laughs> About the holo jokes? <laughs> the holo jokes. Right, we cannot um, make Holocaust jokes three podcasts in a row. After I don't know. Like, two is like the litmus. After that, you're like anti-Semitic. Yeah. One, yeah. Once you hit three Holocaust uh, jokes in a row, is is talking about Holocaust jokes a Holocaust joke? I feel like we pro- we're probably skirting a line here. In a meta sense, I guess it is. Speaking of meta, let's talk about social media. Uh, mm-hmm. So Meta is not going to regulate Trump's since Trump announced. That's great. That's Twitter's cool. on fire, and that's hilarious. But it has real world consequences. It doesn't so, it suck that. But but like that's good though because Facebook is famous for their their bias against conservatives. Like it's been proven that they hate conservatives. They don't amplify their voices. And wait a second, what's this study that I'm seeing? What's this? Uh, oh, I don't actually. The Republicans do really really well on Facebook, oh, and are actually hey. like some of the most. It's almost like share. the algorithm works in their favor. Same yeah, it's with almost YouTube, like the algorithm. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, like Twitter's a li- well, it was a little bit more uh, hard on conservatives, but YouTube and dude, that was Vietnam Facebook. like three years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like they are very kind to conservatives. Like what they are, you know, what they're harsh on f- for the most part is hate speech, and for some reason that tends to target conservatives more. Hmm. Like Probably the actual ideas. All right, I just watched the Matt Walsh uh, "What Is a Woman" documentary uh, last you're night. You're never getting that, that those time. Of your I'm life never back. getting that time back. All right, but that was straight up fascist propaganda. That fascist propaganda. Did he? Answer and it the was question? promoted. It was. Oh yeah. Oh, you want to know how that movie ends? It's here's all you it, need to know. Here's how, how the movie end? ends. All right, he uh, goes up to his wife in uh, in their kitchen or a, a prop kitchen or whatever, and he asks his wife. <sighs> You know what I've been trying, uh, this entire documentary I've been asking, let me ask you, what is a woman? And then his wife, or an actor, I don't actually don't, I actually don't know, uh, comes up to him and says, well, a woman is an adult human female, and this woman needs help opening this jar. And, he ha- and she hands him a jar for him to open because he's the big strong man. I'm not making that up. Wow, that is That is how that profound. movie ends. How, how long was that movie? <laughs> it was an uh, hour and a half-ish. So you needed an hour and a half just to say a woman is an adult human female? Yep. Okay, can we define adult human female? Uh, can, yeah, can we find adult? <laughs> yeah, a very political thing, isn't it? Yeah, what, it, there's something that really, really, really struck me in that, uh, that he asked, he asked uh, someone, a random person on the street, like, since they were having trouble, like, giving a big definition to woman, and he said, like, can you define a cat? And they couldn't. And then I thought, and it seems... If you don't think about it, that seems like a big gotcha. Like, everyone knows what a cat is. You can't define a cat. Can you define a cat right now? Small mammal, four legs, tail, whiskers, meows. No, I can't define a cat. <laughs> like, sm- yeah, like, you have to, like, it's a little hard. Like, fe- like a lot of people say feline. Well, like, Th- okay. That's circular. Feline's a cat. Cat's a feline. Like, same with, yeah, how, like, how, 
female woman, woman's female. How, yeah, how about adults? An adult, uh, that's someone who's 18. All right, why is someone who's 18 adult? Because they're an adult. Because we said Other parts so. of the world is 16. Other yeah, parts like of the world someone is, consider, yeah. when someone, it's like the, the circular definition is someone who is considered an adult. What's a, fe- what's a female? Depends on who you ask. Someone who produces large immobile gametes. Okay, what about chromosomes? Uh, you can define woman by chromosomes too, sure. Uh, what about someone who, is, who has a vagina? Uh, you can define it by genitals too, uh, sure. Uh, okay, how, does, how do most people, like, they, when they interact with the world, how do they define female? Uh, secondary sex cal- characteristics and, and social presentation. Uh, okay, so, yeah, I will say the, the thing that movie taught me the most was I do need to have a pretty good definition of what a woman is because that, that is very strong on their part. Because what they want, what conservatives want, they love, they relish a deep inning curiosity about the world. They don't want to, they already know the truth. Oh, the opposite. Because, they don't want that. No, they, they want a deep in curiosity. Oh, yes. In curiosity. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, yeah, they want to cultivate uh, uh, in curiosity. Like, in this movie, and, and you'll, notice, and you'll notice this in a lot of other conservatives talk, uh, conservatives as well. One of the jokes he made is he went to a, a, you know, a gender studies professor and he said, okay, what's the difference between, and Matt asked him, what's the difference between sex and gender? And he and was then, given an answer and then he played yeah, he gave a, over it. Yeah, he gave a long answer, or a, it might have been a long answer. Uh, they edited it uh, with music over it and, you know, the fading in. D- d- they were trying to, like, let him, they were trying to show that he was talking for a long time. And so a complex answer apparently is bad. Good answers are very short and simplistic. Yeah, tits. Um, well, what's, that, the that sex and, what's the difference between sex and gender? I didn't have gender with your dad last night. That's the answer he wanted. You leave my dad alone. I completely forgot where we were going with that. <laughs> yeah, do we? Do we? I remember? had to stand up for my dad for a second. <laughs> um, he broke his heart once already. Just, I'm sorry. Just, just leave him. Leave him alone. The poor leave man. Him. Just let him. Let him live in love. Let him um, live in love and peace. No, what, what is, so you're right about this deep in curiosity. What is a woman is not a question trying to actually ask what a woman is. It's just a way of framing, boxing trans women out of being women. But if we take this definition let, that you provided earlier, this biological definition, we can define a woman by gametes, the production of large gametes, gametes, chromosomes. We can define them by the presence of a vagina, so sex organs, presence of a uterus, and presence of secondary ca- sex characteristics. There are conditions, such as swire conditions, that do not allow women to produce, people who look and identify as women, who do not allow women to produce large gametes. There are conditions in which women are born without vaginas. They actually have to have one surgically crafted. Uh, There are conditions where women are born with XY chromosomes instead of XX. And, And I say women because they look like women, they identify as women, they seem to check every box that would make them a woman. They were assigned female as birth? They were assigned were female at birth. at birth, yeah, and they identify with that. So our, our, our rigid structure of these biological definitions breaks down when all of these real-world conditions are introduced. So what is a woman? If you say a woman is defined by these, deal with the fact that people like this exist and find a way to square your definition with them because they can't be women if your definition is rigid like that. A woman cannot be somebody with large gametes if you have somebody who, produces large, who does not produce large gametes that you still consider a woman. And let's and I, I I want some justification on why that's a good definition anyway, because when we use the word woman, it's not like, like in day to day life for the ninety nine point nine nine percent of people. When you use the word woman, are you referring to gametes? When you refer no. to someone as a woman, you are you're you referring to social characteristics. Like, like actually, that's... N- yeah, none of us have ever seen gametes. I, I've seen some gametes. You haven't. I, I went in. I, I went in with a. A magnifying glass. Are you in, okay? Well, you in with the magnifying glass? Well, you put. Not everybody's going to put in that extra effort to see games. They should. It's a lot of fun. It is. I, I feel like uh, like getting the microscope up in there requires a lot of finagling and some flexibility from your partner. I had to do a little stretching before. Oh, oh, your game. Okay. All right. No, not my game. It's my girlfriend's game. It's oh, okay. I, I, my my gametes come out of me. I'm like, yeah, but you, you can see uh, my gametes pretty easy. You don't. You don't see the gametes. You just see like. Well, you know, some d- d- fluid, all right? There could be no gametes in there. In fact, people- uh, That's why you need the magnifying glass, dipshit. Uh, you know what? I walked into that one, obviously. Yeah, that's way easier. Yeah, so I, I guess a, a better structural definition for what is a woman would just be somebody, a person, who possesses the characteristics associated with the female sex. That would probably be the best way I could think of defining it. The way I've, I like to define it, and uh, Merriam-Webster actually has this. 
they get one th get I would change it one way. All right, let me make let me make sure I'm uh, reading it right. Mayor BM Webster. We're gonna have to magic of editing this shit out again. Yeah, well, that's what that's what we do. Just a question: Are we ever gonna talk about Elon Musk? Uh, uh, Elon Musk? I think I think we actually have to leave Elon Musk out of this one for the day. What? The world needs to revolve around Elon Musk. He's tweeting at Stephen King, man. Can we we can't talk about how funny it is? Eli Lilly lost billions in the stock market. $15 billion loss in market cap because of a fake Twitter account. <coughs> okay, this Elon has Elon Musk to do with literally anything. walked into Twitter with a sink. Uh, okay. But yeah, let's go ahead and talk about gametes and women and bitches. I uh, no, I I really want to I have I went here for answers, but I have several more questions now. All right, so Merriam-Webster and dictionary.com both put the first definition of woman as an adult female person. So not an adult human female, uh, an adult female person. And, you know, I'm fine with keeping that, right? Like, mm -hmm. defini like words have lots of definitions because words are complicated. But then on dictionary.com, the fourth definition is, I don't know if this is right, a woman who is a servant or personal attendant. I have questions. One, because they have, that's a circular definition. They, they use the, they use the word they're defining in the definition, but also why is a woman who is a servant or personal attendant? Why is that? Why is that defined under woman? That's really weird. The, uh, definition number six, a woman who is extremely fond or devoted to something specified. Oh man. I, there's That's actually a reason weird. for this. I have to go look for it again. Cause I don't remember exactly what it was, but I think uh, and, etymologically, and <laughs> And in, in, in dictionary.com, the second definition, so the first one, adult female person, the second definition is a female employee or representative? Why? That is truly what a woman is. And a, a woman from the real estate agency called. All right. With dictionary.com, uh, they say an adult female person, and they say compare man and girl, because words are defined by their opposites in a lot of ways. As fucked up and horrible as Derrida is to read, because he was intentionally obtuse on purpose, it words are defined by other words. I actually am fine and comfortable with the definition, with a second definition of woman being someone whose gender is the opposite of man. I think that's fine. It seems circular the other way, but okay. I, circular the other way, but... Hey, who cares? They're circular. A woman is a female, a female is a woman, a woman is a female, a female is a woman. It's circular the other way, too. Like, their, their definition is just a circular. There is this thing that exists that is called female that we can generally identify by a certain set of physical characteristics. This thing that is called female has a certain number, of, a certain set of social characteristics also associated with it. And mannerisms, appearance, dress, what have you, right? That is not exactly microscopic. That's primarily what we're looking at when we're defining woman. I, I'm perfectly content just to say a woman is a person who possesses or wishes to possess a, the, the, the characteristics associated with the female sex. And not all of them necessarily, just any of them. Some of them. Someone with a primarily feminine gender. There you go. Yeah. What's feminine? Woman. What's woman? Female. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, well, do it yeah. the other way again. I was like, it, it literally every, if they try to catch you on that, literally every, de every definition can do that. Like you can anyway, do that so. Literally every definition, so. So anyway, we're coming up on an hour. Do we, do we want to get into Elon Musk? Do we, do we want to hit him for the third week in a row? Because I mean, by, the time this po by the time this podcast comes out, we're usually like, a, you know, we record it on a Thursday and we release it the next Thursday. By the time this podcast comes out, Twitter might be on fire. By the time this comes out, Twitter might be gone. That's why you talk about it while you can. It's, <laughs> it's very relevant to the now. It, it could be ancient history in a week, you know? It seems relevant to talk about all, all right, of the let, crazy shit that's happening. All right, let's do a rapid fire. Rapid fire Elon Musk greatest hits in the past week. What's your favorite thing that he's done in, uh, in the week since we've last talked about him? What's, 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 your, uh, what's your favorite thing that he's done? I, I could tell you something that made me feel like sad for him um, like because I legit think he's autistic. I think him tweeting at Stephen King that I'm a fan of your work after Stephen King is roasting him on Twitter and then deleting it shows that he's he suffers from some like communicate. He has like a communication deficit. He suffers from an ability to communicate or read people. And that's not to excuse or apologize for him being an asshole because he is an asshole in more ways than one. But I think maybe it might like exacerbate it, you know, like maybe if he didn't have some underlying autism. I have no idea if he does. I'm just saying like that's my read from that tweet. So him tweeting at Stephen King ghost emojis, then saying I'm a fan and then deleting the tweet, like actually like hurt me because it looked like 
it looked like he was just trying to to reach out an olive branch and then just got rejected. And I think we all know what that's like, and that hurts. Yeah, but uh, unfortunately, not, not all of us can like uh, step away from the computer or, or whatever holographic image he uses to to, to browse Twitter for ten hours a day, uh, and we can't fall back into a bed of money. That bed of money certainly helps. I, here's the the better one, I suppose. He did get into an argument with one of his own engineers on Twitter. Uh, and then fired him on Twitter, which mm-hmm. is funny, because he wanted to blame him for Twitter running slow, and I, I guess he didn't understand what he was doing. So he the doesn't person, know what like, the fuck he's correct, doing. Yeah, of course. So then the he, he put in rockets into space. Explained. He can, I love it. He, he put rockets into space. He he can figure out how how I think he probably hired works. somebody to do it, and he should just he let say, the people yeah, who are experts at this talk. Didn't he say that? Like he's like, I'm pretty sure uh, I know more about this than somebody who's done coding for a couple of years. Like, he doesn't know what the... He obviously doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. Why isn't um, he doing the coding if he knows so much about it? Probably the richest part about it. So, there's there's always two reactions to this. Um, it's either people who are mocking Elon or people who are mocking the, the Twitter person who just got fired. And some were saying something to the effect of, well, if you're going to roast your boss publicly, you know, instead of sending a private email or anything like that, like, you know, you're not, you're not exhibiting any kind of loyalty. Yeah, of course you're going to get fired. Why would anybody want you around? You, you're, not, you're not a team player. Elon hasn't been a team player. Elon fired people when he took over Twitter and didn't tell them. They had to find out when they couldn't log into their emails or their computers. He's created an environment where roasting him on Twitter and then getting fired for roasting your boss on Twitter could be very good for your career. He's so hated. (laughs) Yeah, he's so hated and is just so incompetent that publicly addressing that, that person is going to be picked up now, right now. They they just got picked up. I'm, yeah, I and to to their credit, I don't know why anybody would exhibit loyalty to a boss that shows no loyalty the other way. I don't like if he's firing people who don't even know they're fired, and then call someone. It's like, hey, I re- I realize I need you back because I need to do something else. Come back, like, dude, I'm flipping you off on my way out. Fuck yourself. Like you just took and away my now, job. And you want now, me to help you? yeah, he, you fired half of your workforce, and then with the half that you got left, you're telling them that. Now you have to work way fucking harder. The intensity needs to be through the roof. We need to be hardcore. Did that accompany a pay raise for any of these employees? I have no idea. It, I, think, I feel like we would have heard about that. But if you're demanding more work for the same pay, if you're the richest man on earth and that's what you're demanding, I think I, I would be going to the competitors. Th- yeah, I'd be looking for jobs at, at Instagram or, or uh, Facebook. I'd be, sh- I'd, I'd be leaking secrets. I'd be leaking everything. Well, I assume they signed NDAs. So I don't think they can just leak secrets. But. I, w- I would be. I don't. Want ca- I wouldn't care. I'd be black. Li- <laughs> no, no matter what legal trouble okay. I went through, <laughs> I think that would matter quite a lot. Firstly, you would go through legal trouble. <laughs> Secondly, why the fuck would anybody else hire you if you're just going to leak secrets on your way out? Why would Facebook hire you? Because fuck Elon Musk. Okay. <laughs> um, I, there is one other thing I want to talk about, and then we can kick it whatever way you want. Elon is v- so. I think a lot of people. So I, I, we spent the last, I don't know, 10 years with the right saying, learn to code, learn to code, learn to code to journalists left and right. Um, and they shit on humanities degrees and they say, oh, you don't need art. You don't need music. You don't like they, they've, they found so many different ways to castigate people who pursue any sort of a humanities interest and they favor STEM. Now you have people who work, put in the work to get STEM degrees, people who put in the work to be engineers or coders, uh, who are working jobs that would be required of a 21st century economy, basically being laid off by a billionaire without cause for no real reason other than they work at a, at, at a company that, that conservatives dislike, right? They don't know any of these people as people. No, they don't understand any of these people as persons. They've never met them. Uh, but there's a celebration, this sort of a naked celebration of this from the right that is very, is very classist. And, and it's like almost disgusting because these are people who did work hard. These are people who, who put in the work to be the people that Republicans keep wanting people to become. And their jobs are just lost. They lost their, their livelihoods. They've lost their work. Uh, they've been penalized for, for no reason of their own, but a, a grown man-child's ego decided to take over a company, uh, lay off people at random, blame people, uh, and, and strip and, and, and remove everything that kind of made this, this company a company. And that's, that's all of these people's life work and hard work. So don't let the right convince you that they have the interests of working class people at heart. They don't. They have the interests of people they like at heart. It doesn't matter if you're working class. Uh, it doesn't matter 
who you are. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter who you are as a person. You're a good person or a bad person. It doesn't matter what your religion is or your race is. It just matters that you are the opposite of what it is they like in any given day. So if they like Elon and it's any given day, if you are opposite to that, they're good to see you hurt. You are either a hardworking American who's fallen on hard times or a lazy leech on society, depending purely on how you vote. True. And to a very slightly lesser degree, what color your skin is. (laughs) Just slightly. (laughs) Just a little slight. Well, something that's a little, a little encouraging. So I, the scariest thing about the initial uh, Elon takeover was that the richest man on the planet can just come in and take over the biggest social media platform, at least in the West. I'm sure there's bigger ones in like China and stuff and just uh, twist it to his whims. And not only has that gone so bad that his reputation as is ruined, like he, he was never, he was always like, he lucked into a lot of things and it was always like the people underneath him who were doing all the work and him taking all the credit for it. But now that he's taking all the credit for it and things are going bad, now it's showing that he doesn't know shit. It's all at a whim. He doesn't know how to work with other people. He really, really wants to be in charge and being, he, he, I feel like his, uh, I don't know if he's a genuinely evil person at heart. I think that money just corrupts to a certain extent, but I do think he thought of himself as like the cool. Yeah. Well, I think he thought of himself as a quirky, eccentric billionaire who was like the real life Iron Man. That's how I thought of himself. That's how he wanted to do it. But now it shows that he actually is not Iron Man. He doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. It's in his ego caught up with him. And now he's losing more of his workforce. So now now he's losing more of his workforce because, you know, he he cut the 50 percent, right? Mm hmm. And right. he got rid of Twitter lunches. And Just he got rid of the qu- Twitter lunches, yeah. Because cool, you know why? <laughs> and now, of the people that were left, there was like 3,700 people left. 75% of them didn't sign. Okay, let, let's, let's reiterate. He sent out that you have to start working hardcore, long hours if you want to be a part of this company. And if you're not ready to do that, uh, and if you don't sign up for that by today... Uh, like time of recording, like today, uh, then uh, you can leave and we'll give you a three month severance package. Well, only 25% of them did that. 75% of those 3,700 people who are left didn't sign it and it were past the deadline. And so he tried to pull his weight, like he tried to threaten their jobs. And now he's slowly realizing that he can't run this company he by himself. He can't do it on a skeleton. He's first. actually the least important person here. Not only, actually, he's the most important in terms of how much harm he can do, but he is the least important in terms of how much good he can Odd, do. Oddly enough, he's very much a passenger on this ride. Um, just, just to quickly correct something, this is a, a thing, so we might have a fundamental disagreement here. Have you ever heard of Lord Acton's axiom? Nope. Lord Acton's axiom is a statement that uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So when you say, like, well, Elon got a lot of money and that might have corrupted him, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that at all. I don't think power corrupts. Power reveals. Power reveals who you are and who you were always meant to be. It just, who who you could be when you had the power to do whatever you want reveals what you've always wanted to do. And in Elon's case, it is to bully his way to the top. It is to cast other people aside and put himself as the star player in, in in a social media world where he is being worshiped. That's who he always was. He's always wanted this. Twitter had a CEO before that wasn't a jackass on Twitter. That wasn't always a horse's ass. Um, we can we say is Jack, uh, the CEO, Jack Dorsey. Mm-hmm. But he didn't pull these kinds of shenanigans. He, he, you know, this, this is a uniquely Elon thing. Jack Dorsey is not poor, right? There, there are people out there who have wealth that don't become total assholes. Uh, so I don't agree that this is a byproduct of the wealth corrupting him. He was always a corrupt individual. He, he's been molded like that from a young age. He just now has the money to act on that corruption. Not, you know, I don't disagree with that. I prefer, I was kind of thinking of it in like a systems thing. Like if you're born into wealth, that's going to necessarily like impact your worldview, probably for the worse in terms of like how you treat people who are, who you might, you might perceive as lesser than you. So it's like a combination of like, if you're born into power, born into privilege, born into wealth, you know, it's hard to say that you're inherently evil if, if that ends up, like, fucking your worldview. So, there's, okay. I, you know what? We'll say that we're both right. But I'm more right. You're more right, but I'm not wrong. And that's what the important thing is. I think it's more important that I'm right. 
Okay, well, I think it's more important that I'm not wrong. Okay, I, I think we need to stop this <laughs> before before I kill you, right? That's fine. If, I, I'm right, and you can be more not wrong when we're offline. If anybody, so this is going to come out late, nobody's going to see it, right? Because it's already going to be a week that's passed. But for anybody who's going to show up to Dallas uh, on Saturday to see Justin debate live, he's going to be debating Alex Stein. Uh, certainly hope to see you there. I'll be there. Uh, I'm going to be a cheerleader for my boy Justin. Uh, I am hoping to see you guys there if you show up. Stardust is going to be there, who is awesome. Uh, Destiny is going to be there, who is awesome. Alex Stein's going to be there, who is weird. He doesn't believe yeah. dinosaurs are real. I have you ever seen one? I you know what I haven't. I, I do oh, have to be honest. Shit! I thought of the perfect <laughs> analogy. Fuck! I was thinking about this podcast in the car on the way home, and I thought of this perfect analogy of Trumpism, and I didn't get to use it. So I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna use it now on the closing minutes. Okay. Cool. Trumpism is very much like the dinosaurs from Jurassic Park. The Republicans saw this being created, and they were so preoccupied by whether or not they could. Right, that they let the dinosaurs out of the park, and now it's eating the party. Right now, now people are getting eaten. Good job, Republicans. You let Trumpism out. Hell yeah, good analogy. Totally. Now, now I totally wasted at the end of this, out of place. It works because all I was thinking of the, uh, about this is like, how what tense do you use? I wasn't great in English in high school. It's like the the. the few, I will have done this. So yeah, by the time this episode comes out, I we will have gone to Plano, Texas, which is like not right next to Dallas. We will have gone there. I will have debated Alex Stein uh, and Jackson Hinkle. Uh, and, you know, Stardust is going to be on my side during one of those panels. So Math the Infidel, Destiny will be there. We will have done that. We will have hung out. And so me bringing this up is either going to be a neat little nudge for you to go watch uh, those debates, or it will be a a tragic comedy of my downfall and arrest. From it would be drunken pretty and funny to con. upload this next week if you end up making a total horse's ass of yourself. Or if I get arrested for drunken disorderly conduct for punching somebody in the mouth. Uh, is James Lindsay going to be there? He's not. Okay, look, we need to make a target priority list. If there's <laughs> going to be violence, I'm not saying we should look for violence, but if there's going to be violence, we need to start prioritizing who that violence is directed at. By the way, remember, Republicans are the ones that like violence, not me. <laughs> of course. Remember, we can do whatever we want. It's our podcast. True. True. Okay, well, with that um, endorsement, with that explicit endorsement of political violence aside, I think that's all we have time for today. I, th I think we can't fit in any more admission of guilt and crime in this one episode. We're going to have to save it for next time, in which we will, uh, you know, obviously, presumably be podcasting from a uh, penitentiary. I'll I'll have carved my way out with a spoon and with I'll spoon? hide it behind a uh, the hole behind a poster of a of a hot lady. Anyway, Arriva Derchi. Arriva Derchi, thank you for listening to this episode three of the Waste Potential podcast. We will catch you next time.